This is the Straight Truth Podcast, biblical answers to difficult questions from a Christian worldview. So my question is on Christians and voting, and how like we can't vote Democrat and be Christian because of their beliefs on like abortion and um, transgender, homosexuality, etc. Like some people in our congregation vote that way, but like, um, like how can you like can you point me to like some verses in scripture, like to point people to when they're heading in the wrong direction? Yeah. Well, first off, I, I don't, I honestly don't know. I would assume someone in our congregation may have voted that. I don't know how people vote in our church, and, and nor do I spend my time trying to dictate how they do. What what I want us to do is learn the, the Word of God in its fullness, be saturated with Scripture, and then apply that worldview to everything we do in life, including our role as citizens in this country. I think the, the question you, you raise, what sort of gave birth to that was, Dr. John MacArthur was asked on camera several months ago if he believed that a Christian could vote Democrat, and he answered no. And from that point on, I, I noticed on social media and other things, a lot of people saying, is that what he really believes? Is that what, I even had someone ask me, is that what we believe, that you could, you, a, a Christian can't vote Democrat? I think his original statement was misunderstood. I don't think what he was saying is examine the roles of those who voted Democrat and every single one of those people you can know is lost. I don't think that's what he was saying at all. I think what he's saying is he, de- he didn't believe that you could serve Christ, be true to the scriptures and affirm the democratic platform. You can't vote for that. And to that, I would agree. I, I believe that as well. And you mentioned in your question, Rihanna, some of the reasons why, whether we're talking about abortion, which is a major issue, we're talking about murder. We're talking about the murder of babies in the womb. And you're talking about legitimizing that, not just legitimizing it as we have done sadly in our culture, but actually it's come to the point, people are promoting it. I mean, they're glorying in it. So, so that's one issue. The issue of what's gonna happen with our next generation of children regarding what they're being taught about sexuality and gender. Uh, this is a major, major issue. When I hear a politician running for president of the United States who is asked a question about whether an eight-year-old should be allowed to transition and he doesn't immediately condemn that and disavow that, he in fact affirms that kind of freedom, even, even for young children, that is amazing to me. I, I, as a 57-year-old man now, I never thought I would see the day in our country where that was affirmed by someone running for president. It's amazing. How can you affirm that? When you talk about the celebration of all sorts of what the Bible would clearly characterize as sexual immorality, that which is abhorrent in the sight of God, an abomination to Him, and we, again, don't just allow for people to live that way by saying, well, you know, we're going to leave people the freedom to do what they think they should do. But we're going to affirm it and celebrate it. And, and let that even be passed on in the form of public education and how we're going to train the next generation. These are, are monumental issues. And I don't, I agree with Dr. MacArthur. I don't know how a, a well-informed, a Bible-informed believer can affirm that. So what, what we're not saying is that anybody who voted for a Democrat is lost. I'm not saying that, and I don't believe he was saying that. What I am saying is that that platform is out of step with the Word of God. Now, I wanna say just as clearly that, you know, we live in basically a two-party system of government. So the this is why I'm not gonna compare what I just said to libertarians or the Green Party or whatever. I'm gonna talk about Republicans for a moment. Republicanism is increasingly moving away from the things we believe as well, which is why what we ought to identify as is not Republican or Democrat, but Christians. And what we're looking to do in every election, in my view, is I'm examining the platforms and I'm asking which of these is at least closest to a Judeo-Christian worldview 
versus an agnostic, atheistic worldview. And then I want to use whatever influence I have as a citizen on behalf of a culture that will represent the best atmosphere for my children and my grandchildren and my brothers and sisters in Christ and the work of the church as we head into the future. That's what I'm looking at. And that's what I would encourage every Christian to do, to think that way, to examine the issues that way and to vote that way. So, so that, I hope that answers your question. I, I would not understand Dr. MacArthur or what I say to mean anyone who voted for a Democrat is lost. I also have like a follow-up question. Sure. So like, um, how do you nicely tell someone like you're heading in the wrong direction without someone like sounding like yeah. You're That's a wonderful question. Attacking them. Yeah, you, you do it, like we talk about a whole host of things, you have to do it with dependent effort. So what you want to do is not make it about me and you. If I'm talking to another person, it's not about me and you. It's about the, the Bible. Let's go to the Word of God. Let's evaluate these platforms in light of what the Scriptures say. I'm not going to disagree with you that there are going to be problems on both sides. I'm asking which best reflects a Christian worldview as compared to the other. And let's just talk about this. I, I would prepare you in advance though, Brianna. We're living in a day of, of what I call um, high confidence but low competence. <laughs> mm. people, people are very impressed with themselves and with their opinions. Even, even when you can show them the weakness of their viewpoint, they often will hold to it with great tenacity. So I've got to understand that at the end of the day, I can say along with Joshua, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I can only be responsible for my own choices in the ultimate sense. The Lord, may the Lord use me to help someone else think rightly and choose rightly, but at the end of the day, uh, I can't dictate that. I can seek to influence them, but I have to leave them in the hands of God. And I can, I can hopefully reflect, you know, I reflect and it gives me hope to remember the days of my young foolishness. <laughs> when, I, when I thought I was so right about things that I found out later I was so wrong about. And so in that kind of, with that kind of patience and compassion, especially as, as I think about the younger generation, I can pray for you guys and, and hope that you'll have the humility and the wisdom to learn from the generation ahead of you. That's one of the great challenges we're facing right now in our day and age, is a lack of respect for biblical wisdom and experience with God. How long has this person walked with God versus myself? And I'm increasingly meeting with 22 year olds who know everything. They would think probably it's like the grumpy old man saying, get off my lawn, but it's actually more along the lines of, I fear for you. A fool is right in his own eyes, always. And may we have the kind of humility that's willing to learn. And that's true when you're my age. You still have to have the humility that's willing to learn. So we're on dangerous ground whenever we think we know everything. Hmm. And, um, and so I pray, I pray for what's going on in our country. Pastor, almost every sector of culture right now has been hit with revelations about long admired people that have been revealed to have secret, disgusting lives. And this goes from the top echelon of our government all the way down to the local pastor. And in most cases, this means at least the loss of respect and integrity for these people. Now, we know that Christians and non-Christians alike obviously sin, and that's not what we're arguing here. But what do we really do when it's somebody that is supposed to be leading in a certain way? Us, and they're supposed to be leading our people. So, for instance, in this past couple of weeks, uh, there's been this revelation about the alleged affair that President Trump has had with Stormy Daniels. How should the church really respond to something like this? Yeah, um, it's a sad state of affairs. And unfortunately, uh, as believers, we can't, we can't act as if these things are not happening in our world. Um, in John chapter 17, Jesus prays for us, for his people. He doesn't pray that the Lord would take us out of the world but that we'd be kept in the midst of it. So even though we're a people who are not of the world, we live in the world. And as a result, uh, we're aware of these things that, are, that happen in our world. We're asked questions about these things that happen in our world. And we have to think about these things. Um, how we think about these things is important. I wanna say something at the outset because um, it's important to me because I don't wanna be guilty of something that I, th I think is wrong. And that is we, we have a handful 
a very famous, visible, accomplished evangelicals whom I respect. They're asked questions about these sorts of things. They give their answers. I don't think they mean to be spokespeople for the entire church, but I think sometimes we treat them like they're spokesmen for the entire church, like like one person's response is the response that we are all to embrace. And so I just want to make clear from the outset that I know what I am. I, I have a God-given responsibility to be an under-shepherd to one local congregation on the face of this planet. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's my responsibility. Mm-hmm. So someone might ask, well, then why do you do a podcast like this, and why do you answer a question in a public forum? And the answer is because I still think it's helpful. I think that's why other men do so as well. I think it's helpful for believers to, to have someone else think through an issue with them, mm-hmm. not, to, not to represent what their view must be or where they must mm-hmm. land on it, but just to give an example for how we think through these kinds of issues, because mm-hmm. we all have to think through these kinds of issues. So I just want to make that clear that I'm not speaking, you know, the world is not my parish. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a responsibility with Founders Baptist Church. And so I would encourage people, ask these same questions to your pastor. Ask these same questions to your elders because they have responsibility to uh, to watch for your soul. Mm -hmm. My own thinking is if we're going to think about these things well, we have to think about these things in categories. Mm -hmm. It's too simplistic. If someone walks up to me and says, what do you think about? Uh, the alleged incident between Stormy Daniels and the president. It, that's too simple a question. I, I want to ask, or too simplistic a question. I have to ask, well, from what vantage point are you asking me this? Mm-hmm. Are you asking me about uh, how such an accusation might reflect on his claim to be a Christian? Um, does this say, do we need to think about this at all in, in, in the realm of the genuine fruits of salvation? Mm-hmm. Uh, are you asking me about the impact this might have on a nation when its, when its chief leader mm-hmm. um, is associated with such things? That, that's a different kind of answer. Are you asking me how I should think about this as a future voter, mm-hmm. as a citizen of the nation? Uh, should this change the way I think about voting in the future? That's another aspect of the question. So I think there are categories around which we consider something like this. So let me just talk about a few of those categories. Uh, One of the things I think we ought to be troubled by, and this is not just related to the president, this is related athletics, um, the entertainment industry, Mm -hmm. uh, family, our children, um, person we're married to. When we take someone we love or admire or we've invested something in them emotionally and we try to argue um, for a for their conversion, for the reality of their salvation. And we ignore the biblical statements about what genuine salvation looks like. That is a big problem. Uh, We have to understand that we don't determine what salvation is. Mm -hmm. God is the, is the savior and the fruits of salvation are the fruits that he has given voice to in the scriptures. I don't get to determine what genuine salvation looks like. The Bible tells me what genuine salvation looks like. We all must evaluate ourselves by that standard. And so it doesn't matter whether it's a wayward child or it is your father or mother or it's the president of your country. Um, You have to take a person's lifestyle and measure it against what Scripture says genuine salvation looks like and then know whether you need to pray for their salvation or pray for a believer to, to repent. And we can't know that perhaps finally or, or with all certainty, but we still have to be honest with the evidence. So I don't know uh, the current state of the president's marriage or family life or anything. I don't know where he's at today. What I do know <clears throat> is that if, if these sorts of things, some of which we know took place in his past. So I'm thinking now about his very public affair with Marla Maples years ago. Mm-hmm. If these sorts of things took place as a pattern and regularly, we, we know what the Bible says about that kind of pattern and what and the statement it makes about salvation. It speaks of someone who doesn't know Christ. Even in the present, um, and now this is not just about the president, this is about anyone. When, when a person's manner of speaking is consistently filled with profanity, when their viewpoints are consistently at odds with the scriptures. Again, these are not the things that speak of eternal life. So I'm a little concerned when we try to Christianize people instead of just just letting them be what they are. Um, 
as a Christian, I, I don't believe that I have to vote for only Christians when it comes to public office. Mm-hmm. If I have the, the opportunity to do that, that's a blessing. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, I'm to pray for those who, who are in leadership. I pray for their salvation. Mm-hmm. I, I think 1 Timothy 2, the context is evangelistic prayer. We're mm-hmm. praying for their salvation. It would be wonderful if we had Christians in, in all you know, uh, areas of leadership in our country, but that's just not the case. So I'm not required to say I can only vote for Christians. Therefore, I don't feel the necessity, nor, nor should I, it's very dangerous to try to Christianize someone, um, whether I voted for them or I didn't. Mm. So, so that's, that's one category of thinking about this. In terms of what it does to a nation when our highest leaders are associated with scandal, I, I think about uh, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. It says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I like that verse because, again, I, I think sometimes what we try to do as United States citizens is we try to make the United States sort of a new Israel. Mm-hmm. And, and the fact is that's not what the United States is. It, it isn't Israel. We don't live under the Mosaic law. Um, God's word is not the standard by which our nation is governed. Mm-hmm. It would be wonderful if, if it were, but it's not. Mm-hmm. And so what I would be wrong to do is to is to think in terms of the of the president as if he is the king of Israel. And then I take the standards that should have been applied to the king of Israel and I apply them to the United States president. I try to equate those things. They're, they're not, uh, we, we can't equate them. But that verse is broader than just the nation of Israel. That verse that I just read says that righteousness exalts a nation, any nation. And sin is a reproach to any people, any nation. And so uh, though the United States is not Israel, God is king over the entire earth. <laughs> and when the creator's law is respected, then a nation finds blessing there. And when, a, when the creator is um, sinned against in high-handed ways, rebelled against, rejected, a nation bears the fruits of that rebellion. And so our leaders uh, are important in that, not only do they set a trajectory for where our nation is headed, they actu- actually are a reflection of where we already are. Mm. Uh, it's sad to say, but usually we get the leaders we deserve. Mm. And so when we see um, immorality characterizing our government, you know, in multiple levels, city level, state level, national level, what it says is that we're an immoral nation. And, and so we're electing people who are in our image. And I'm not just talking about President Trump. Um, Again, we try to Christianize leaders. So I, I think you can go back as many presidents as you want to and ask how many of these men were genuinely converted. I can't say with all certainty, but I think there's there are r- good reasons to be concerned about a whole host of them. Mm-hmm. So we, we just have to be honest about, about, about what we're dealing with. It leads to a third thought, and that is, frankly, when it comes to this kind of scan- scandal, I haven't paid attention to it in, in large measure. Mm-hmm. My life is not wrapped up on a day-to-day basis with what's happening in our country politically. Why? Because though I am an earthly citizen of the United States of America, and in, to that degree, I'm a patriot, and I love our country, I'm thankful for the blessings associated with it, I'm a citizen of heaven. This, this nation is not my final home. If I take seriously what the scriptures teach about my place in this world, I am a pilgrim. I am a stranger. I am an alien. I am passing through. I'm a missionary. Um, b- before I know it, my life on this side of heaven will be over, and eternity is before me. And so I'm not, I'm not wrapped up in the, the day-to-day highs and lows of what's happening in the country. I take Romans 13 to heart, which teaches me that I'm to be a submissive citizen. I'm to be a model citizen as a believer. I ought to respect <clears throat> the offices of leadership even when I can't respect the personalities who hold the office. Mm-hmm. So I think many Christians are making a mistake right now. I think some are so outraged by the behavior of leaders in government that they don't, uh, they're not, that believers are not being characterized by the kind of respect and deference to the office that should characterize Christians. I think we ought to be models of, res- of giving honor to those to whom honor is due, respect to those who, to whom respect is due. And in Romans 13, when that's being written, you're talking about a Roman emperor mm-hmm. who, whose personality was not respectful. 
So it's not about the personality. It's about the fact that God works through government. It is like a servant of God. And I ought to have respect for the, for the offices. Um, so I, I take to heart what the scriptures teach me about citizenship. Um, and that includes the fact that this is not my, my final home. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and I think as a kingdom citizen, I think as a citizen of heaven, even as I live my life out as an earthly citizen. There's, there's much more that could be said, but these are the, the I, I, just as a, as a word of exhortation, what I would do, what I would say to my fellow Christians is think about the categories that relate to the question and then realize there are different aspects of this we have to think about as we walk through those categories. Mm. So what is the president's behavior? Again, I'm not saying this, this is true or not. This is alleged. I'm not saying this is his present behavior. This is apparently something from his past, if it, even if it is true. Um, but what I want to do is think about what, what, what does this kind of behavior say about salvation? What does this kind of behavior say about our country? Uh, how wrapped up should I be anyway in this sort of thing on a day-to-day basis? Uh, I, I think the healthiest thing some of us could do is just turn off the news and, and, and dive into the Word of God and realize that I've got work to do today for the sake of the kingdom of Christ. And I have one ambition in life, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, whether in the body or standing before Jesus face to face, to be well-pleasing to him. That's, that's, that's my ambition today. Mm-hmm. And, and so what happened between uh, anyone and someone else uh, really doesn't relate too much to what my calling is today. And so I want to be wrapped up in those things that the Lord wants me to be wrapped up in. And, um, and it's also, final thing I'll say, it's a good opportunity for all of us to examine our own personal integrity. And so uh, if we really believe this is hateful to God, then it's hateful not just in another person. It would be hateful to God in my life. And so I want to be sure to watch for my own uh, purity and fidelity. I want to be faithful to my wife, beginning at the most fundamental place, and that's my mind mm-hmm. and my heart. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, wherever in our lives that, that is not what it ought to be, then let us repent of our sin. Mm-hmm. Um, make sure we examine ourselves before we examine everyone else. So our next question has to do with what's going on in the culture today. Now, at the time we're recording this, this is summer 2020, um, pretty much every weekend there's some sort of demonstration, public demonstration, some rioting even, a lot of pulling down of statues, um, most in response to some tensions in the culture, uh, social justice issues, race, racism issues, and the like. And so this question is about what is going on um, uh, today. So the questioner says, I, I had, had a discussion with friends, and some agreed that it's okay that people are destroying these businesses and, 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 uh, and public places. And they say that that's a way of making the government listen, and even Christians have agreed uh, to some of this, so-called Christians. Um, some have used the example of Jesus, saying how Jesus uh, drove out all the people in, in the temple mm. um, as, as a basis for why it's important to, to destroy some public space in order to get the government to listen to you. So, uh, should Christians ever use violence to be heard? Now, the, answer, the answer to that question is no. We're not revolutionaries. The Bible teaches us submission to human authority. The only time that would be not the case is if we're being asked to violate the Word of God, mm-hmm. in which case we obey Christ. But even that obedience isn't something expressed in violence. It's something expressed in the preaching of the gospel. The New Testament world was no less oppressive than our own. It may have been more oppressive Mm -hmm. than the one that we live in. And yet you find the apostles in the early church not marching and demonstrating and protesting. You find them preaching the gospel. And you find them living out the Christian life before a watching world. And one of the things that, if not the primary thing, in fact, I think I could go so far as to say the primary way that the church was identified in its relationship to Christ was its love. So it's not, it's not what we're seeing in our world right now. It's not language full of venom, hatred, bitterness, cursing, profanity, attacking those in authority. This is never what has characterized mm-hmm. the New Testament church in its finest moments, mm-hmm. if I could say it that way. So the answer, the answer is no. This, this is not what is to characterize us. In terms of 
of using Christ cleansing the temple as an example. That's silly and wrong-headed. Our Lord was the Lord of the temple. He, in fact, was fulfilling Scripture as He cleansed the temple. Zeal for your house has consumed mm-hmm. me. One of the questions that came into play as He cleansed the temple was the matter of authority. You know, they asked Him, by what authority do you do this? And He, he gave, a question, uh, gave an answer regarding John the Baptist that basically put them in a corner. They wouldn't even answer the question. Was John's authority from heaven or, or from earth? Mm-hmm. And they didn't want to answer the question because it was going to get them in trouble with the crowd. So, so the, the whole question of authority came into play with respect to Christ, and He had the authority to cleanse that temple. It's His Father's house, Jesus, the unique Son of God. So that's not an example that we can take for social justice protests. In, in fact, Josh, we're living in a time where justice isn't even understood. Mm-hmm. Now, if you talk about biblical justice in the Old Testament, you're talking about no preferential treatment is really what you're talking about. The Old Testament taught you were not even to give preferential treatment to the poor. Uh, You were not to reward a man just because he was poor, punish a man just because he's rich, or vice versa. The question was always, what is right in this situation? And so when we begin to categorize people based upon superficial things like melanin, like skin color, and and we're going to arrange society based upon those sorts of things, we're not in touch at all with what biblical justice is. So, so again, we're talking about, as we've talked about on an earlier podcast, we're talking about a, a kind of wisdom that's present in the world that doesn't reflect fellowship with God versus a kind of wisdom found in Christ and in Scripture. And these two things are not the same. So when the church tries to embody the wisdom of the world or Christianize it, you can know we're on the wrong road. What, whatever Christ gives us is entirely different from what the world is saying and what the world is doing. And so we need to look to God and to His Word for, for what we do in these days. It seems like more and more there are stories in the news of people who've um, even been in prison for, for kind of holding to the biblical truth or maybe uh, misgendering uh, somebody, their own children. Um, even in Western countries, and there's the, uh, the tension and this pressure that seems to be rising uh, in our culture related to especially issues of, uh, of gender and sexuality. And and really, we have a whole new generation that's being discipled by something like TikTok, Mm. you know, um, uh, where there's this sort of blanket affirmation for how uh, people want to be and live. And especially even in workplaces, it seems to be more and more we get that in the education system, uh, too. So how should Christians, churches prepare to uh, respond to these things lovingly to the culture as, um, as the government, the companies, even individuals, are trying to force an immorality upon us. You know, innocent as doves, shrewd as serpents, but in all things convictional. So there's a predetermination in our lives as believers. When we, by the grace of God, through the gospel of God, saw that Jesus is Lord and received Him as our Savior and God and King, every challenge to his authority, we made a decision about at that moment, Jesus is Lord and will be Lord of my life. So whatever challenges his authority, I yield to him, I follow him. Now we do that imperfectly Mm -hmm. and we do that sometimes with trembling. But at the end of the day, what, what characterizes people who will be in hell is that they're cowardly. And what characterizes people who know Christ is that they cannot deny what they've come to see. You know, mm. I think about John 6 where many disciples are walking away from Jesus, you know, disciples in the sense they've been following him around. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, do you want to go away also? And they make the statement, there's nowhere else for them to go. Who mm. else has the words of eternal mm. life? Well, that's where mm. we are. We're mm-hmm. in the same place. Mm-hmm. So the, the final decision about all these things, you know, so-called misgendering and all the sexual immorality and the madness that we're seeing in our world right now. I, I, just, I just saw yesterday where someone admitted that they had removed the, the breasts of 12-year-olds and castrated 16-year-olds. And I mean, this, is, this is Nazi Germany level mm-hmm. kind of stuff going mm-hmm. on and, and people are not being punished for it and because they're doing it in the name of medicine. Mm-hmm. It, it's madness. So the final decision for us has already been made. We, we cannot, we will not go along with that. Now, when you're talking about business settings, 
where I just have to be careful with my language and all the rest. Maybe there's a way to endure for a while there where we just don't make it a, a pronounced issue. Right. Yeah. But even then, what I can't do is, is lie. Mm -hmm. I, I can't lie. So when, when the time comes that I have to call someone by a pronoun that isn't them, mm -hmm. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. that. I'm speaking for myself. I yeah. can't do that. And yeah. I don't think anybody else should as well. Mm -hmm. So what we cannot do is, is represent Christ with, with lies, we can't represent Christ with cowardice. We have to, to uh, with conviction. You know, conviction is the fruit of faith. Conviction is the fruit of submission to the truth that we know to be true. And so with conviction, we stand our ground. And in so doing, we're standing with Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's the, the uh, disciple's life, to stand with Christ and to suffer with Him. Mm -hmm. So we're not supposed to, um, well, we don't want to, uh, we want to bear the reproach of Christ and we don't want to do it in vain. Right. 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 And, um, and, and the question really is, is like, how, how does that actually play out um, in our relationships, in the workplace? And in what sense should we really be involved in speaking out based on the conviction that you just mentioned? Mm. Should Christians even engage in these things uh, in the culture? You know, it's because it's one thing to be, OK, I'm in a business setting. I'm not going to speak out on something for the sake of my job and my employment. I can still work here. Yeah. I can bear with it right. uh, for that time. But in another sense, you kind of feel this, this uh, impulse to speak out, just say, uh, in the culture at large as a Christian, because we uh, very strongly and have biblical basis for, speaking, for, yeah. for being against these sort of things. Right. Should Christians be involved in, in the pushback? Uh, to governments and to maybe even businesses. In the right kind of way, yes, of course. I mean, what, what Christ has, you know, I'm thinking now about Matthew 10, where we've been lately in our, in our preaching. You know, what Christ taught his disciples in private settings, they were to go declare from the housetops. So mm -hmm. the, the truth is, is not confined to the walls of the church, church building. Believers leave their gatherings where they're taught and discipled and strengthened, and they proclaim the truth in the world. But we live our lives with different circles and spheres of responsibility and therefore authority. So as a Christian living my life in the world, when I go to work, the person in authority over me has assigned me a job. And my task for that day is to do my job. That's, that's my task. Mm -hmm. And I'm being faithful to Christ when I do my job well. M my employer didn't hire me to preach during the eight hours that I'm working for him or her. Mm -hmm. My em em employer wants me to do a job. So I do that. Now, when that same employer comes to me and demands yeah. that I use yeah. pronouns that are contrary Pronouns. to truth, yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm not to be doing is, is seeking to proclaim the message of Christ during the time when I've been given a job to do. Do your job. Mm -hmm. But when I'm off that time and I interact with a fellow, you know, a coworker, and I have opportunity to share the message of Christ. I can do that with with joy and with love and and with boldness, and and not be violating any sort of standard. So we have to just recognize those those spheres of authority and influence, and be faithful in each of those various spheres in accordance with Scripture. Yeah, is it more honorable to, um, uh, let's say, to not speak out so strongly in the culture about these things? Um, for the sake of our witness, um, than it is to speak the truth more boldly in 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 in, in sort of public settings. Is mm -hmm. it more honorable to to not do that rather than to do it? Maybe explain a bit more of what you have in mind. Um, I, I'm I'm more so just thinking that at at what stage should um, should we be proclaiming the truth in the world, which to me sounds more like evangelistic, mm -hmm. to proclaiming the truth in the world because you know it's God's uh, uh, law for our right. for our nature? Right. right. You know, I, I, is there a distinction between those things? Because we can proclaim the truth in the world boldly yeah. in the world all our days. We should be evangelistic. Um, on the other hand, we've got all these pressures around us. Um, um, let's just say from the culture to. Um, uh, you know, to neglect what we know to be true and to kind of adhere to the cultural norms. Should we speak out with a same sort of boldness against those things in the culture as we would um, in terms of our evangelistic efforts? I think wherever the Word of God has spoken. So obviously evangelism is the aim 
for a lost and dying world, right? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not moral reformation that this world needs. Mm -hmm. It is spiritual transformation that this world needs. And moral transformation follows uh, salvation. So everything's going to change mm -hmm. when people know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So my aim is, is first and foremost, their greatest need which is the forgiveness of their sins and the transformation of their very nature, that they would be a new creation in Christ Jesus. But sooner or later, it's unavoidable. We're going to come face to face with questions about what the Bible teaches concerning all these issues that are on the forefront of the, of the culture's concern. And when those times come, I will be true by the grace of God, I pray, right? to the truth of Scripture. I will say what the Bible says about those things when asked or when, when pressed upon uh, to speak the truth. So I don't think what we, in every setting, what we're called to do is, is go out and talk about a particular moral issue, mm. but it's unavoidable, Josh. It's just like mm. John the Baptist. Someone could have argued, well, the Baptist could have had more influence and a longer ministry mm. if he just hadn't confronted yeah, Herod. Kept his mouth shut. Right. <laughs> but, but he was right to do that. He was mm. right to do that. And our Lord spoke of John the Baptist in the highest terms. That's true. Yeah. After he was in prison. Mm -hmm. So, so he, he was not wrong or, uh, or misguided to do that. And it did mean his imprisonment. But, but it was needful. Mm. So these are going to be matters of judgment. Yeah, true. These are going to be That's matters who are led yeah. by the Spirit of God. But what I do want my brothers and sisters to understand is you cannot be faithful to Christ and avoid mm. every, all of the cultural pressures mm. upon mm. the church. Mm. You can't. Mm. So remember the greatest need of humanity. Make that the preeminent message you're declaring. The need is Christ. But sooner or later, you're going to come face to face with someone asking you what you believe mm. about homosexuality, what you believe about transgenderism, what you believe about marriage, what you believe about adultery, what you believe about all these issues, and say what the Bible says. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Straight Truth Podcast. Now, Straight Truth is listener supported. So if you'd like to find out ways how you can help us to continue to produce this podcast, you can go to our website and find out ways to do that, straighttruth.net. At that website, you'll also find links to all of our previous episodes and our social media channels, so be sure to check it out. Straight Truth is a production of Walking in Grace Ministries, the preaching and teaching ministry of Pastor Richard Caldwell. For more information, go to walkingingrace.org.